right? And good evening, depending where you're joining from. I'm Dr. Maruch. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by profession. But um, I've also been facilitating students for over a year, helping them uh, succeed in their OAT exam, be it the medicine one or the nursing one, right? Um, I've joined the MedExpert team uh, very recently. Uh, it is a very dynamic team and I'm um, in interacting with them has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I can very confidently say that all these teachers that you have here um, have only one goal in mind, and that is to help you succeed. Um, so be it the OET course or the MRCP course, please always feel free to reach out to us at any time, right? We're all available around the clock to assist you. Um, before just going to start the session, before uh, we start the session, um, there's some harsh rules. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Leave a question in the chat box. Uh, if you want um, to stop me right there and ask a question, I will be available. Or I have left quite some time, about 15 minutes, right at the end of the session, and you can ask all your queries there, right? Um, so let's start with this. Dr. Sara, a few days ago, has already given a very good overview of the OET exam. Um, she went into detail about the writing criteria. I will go into detail about the speaking criteria, but I'm sure all of you must have already seen uh, the general overview of the OET and you know what the exam is about, right? Um, I see a few participants here. If you can let me know uh, which OET you will be giving, the medicine one or the physiotherapy one or the nursing one, that will help me address your questions better, right? So do write that in the chat box. Let's make this in engaging. Now, talking specifically about the speaking, um, OET speaking uh, part, this only will come after you practice enough times, right? If English is not your first language, it is not your native language, you need to be able to talk fluently. And that only comes with practice and then definitely the feedback that you get from teachers. Um, Basma says she cannot hear me. Can everybody else hear me clearly? Since you are responding to my questions, I believe you can hear me. Basma, maybe you can sign out and sign in again. There seems to be a technical glitch at your end. Right. Okay, so what we will be discussing today is the format of the test, how to prepare for the test, and ultimately what will lead to the success, right? Because um, even if you put in a lot of hard work and you put in a lot of time, but if you're preparing the wrong way, it will not lead to success. So you need to know the right pointers that will make you achieve your goal. Like Dr. Sara last time mentioned, um, minimum criteria for the for doctors who want to go to UK is grade B, right? Um, and that comes around four at four hundred at, at three hundred and fifty. I'm sorry, at three hundred and fifty points. But there are a few doctors uh, who have been preparing with me who wanted to apply for the FY two standalone program or the foundation used year two standalone program. And the criteria um, to be shortlisted for that program is higher than the B score, it is at 400, right? The B score is a cutoff at 350, their criteria is for at 400. So if you want to apply for the FY2 standalone program, then you need to prepare a little more diligently, right? Okay. Now, what is the format of the test? The first picture that you see, there's a boy who's warming up, right? So what do you do when you're going for exercise? You want to make the blood move, right? You want to go moving. You want to make your exercise. Uh, you want to make your muscles all relaxed and you know um, get worked up. For you, you just don't start running, right? Similarly, when you enter the exam area, when you enter the room where your exam will be conducted, 
uh, the interlocutor there will greet you, will ask you your name, will ask you your um, ID number, and will just have a general conversation with you, right? You can ask them how they're doing, you can get used to, to their accent because you're going to have a conversation with them and they can get used to your accent. So this generally lasts for about two to three minutes. And once you're comfortable, once they have confirmed all your details, then they move on right at this point you can let them know about any um, questions you have or any concerns that you may have it might be of the environment maybe you know um it is too cold for you it is too warm for you you want to take off your coat or whatever it is you do that and that is called warming up right after that comes the actual exam now they give you they give you a card and they ask you they give you a card and they uh, put a timer for three minutes now in that card we will discuss as we move further along there will be a scenario and there will be tasks right please remember that oet is in is an english language test it is not a test um to test your medical knowledge or your nursing knowledge right so even if there is a task and you don't know the correct answer um, maybe it is asking you to describe the side effects of a medication, and maybe you don't know the side effects of that medication. Please remember, it is absolutely okay if you just give a generalized answer, as long as it's in the same uh, direction. For example, if they ask you side effects of paracetamol and you don't know, you can just generally tell them it might cause you um, uh, a bit of, you know, a nauseous feeling. Uh, maybe there might be some vomiting. You might get dizzy you know, on those lines. As long as the answer is relevant, it doesn't have to be medically correct. So remember that. This was apart from the point, but um, you will get three minutes to prepare, to read the scenario, and to see what the tasks are and what you need to address. And then you will start, and then the uh, interlocutor will tell you, okay, your three minutes are over now, or we can start the conversation. The card, uh, which will be given to you, which has all the tasks enlisted, will stay with you, right? So you don't have to worry about memorizing. You can look at the card if you forget during the conversation and pick that up right from there. Now, the next thing that will happen is that you will start a conversation. You need to initiate the conversation. Like um, most of you have written down that you are, you are going to, uh, you're preparing for the medicine part of the OET. So you're, I'm sure all of you are doctors and you're already aware of it, that when a patient comes to you, you start the conversation, you initiate, right? So similarly, you greet the patient, you ask them how they are, how they're doing, um, depending if it's a new patient, you confirm their name, their age, and ask them their active complaints. If it's an old patient, you can ask them, oh, how you're doing? It's been a while I've seen you, or is your pain better? Something along those lines. Right? So you will start the conversation. This conversation will last for about five minutes. Um, my sincere advice is even if you're done with the tasks, always keep talking for five minutes. The reason for that is the interlocutor is not marking you for your exam. Rather, this conversation is being recorded and two independent um, examiners will um actually listen to that conversation later on and then mark you right so at, at as much data as they have they will be able to assess you better right maybe there was a slip, a slip of tongue um, initially you know in the first minute you were very nervous and you weren't able to talk properly but gradually after the first minute or the first 30 seconds you picked up and you were fluent in your conversation and you were very natural so the examiners will not count, uh, will not focus on those first 30 seconds. So it's important that you actually keep talking for five minutes to let the examiner know that you know the language, right? So this um, whole um, scenario will ap approximately last from 10 to 12 minutes, including the warm up, the three minutes, which you will be given to prepare, and then the five minutes where you will actually talk to the interlocutor who will act as a patient, right? Are there any questions so far? Now, what is the criteria? How will they judge you, right? There are two major criteria on which you will be judged 
it will be the linguistic criteria, one, and the second will be the communication criteria, right? Um, we will discuss this in detail, how both these criteria vary and what the both mean. Now, the linguistic criteria basically has four components which you need to focus on, right? Um, the intelligibility, the fluency, the appropriateness, and the resources of expression and grammar. So what does intelligi intelligibility mean? It means what your pronunciation, your accent, right? Um, is the patient able to understand what you're trying to say? Are your words clear enough? What, what does intonation mean? Intonation means, um, is your voice rising and dropping as it should in a native speaker? For example, while I'm talking, uh, do I have a monotonous tone, right? Um, are there any highs or lows in the tone? In a natural conversation, there are always highs and lows. For example, when I ask you, how are you doing? You know, and you can tell me, oh, I'm not doing so well. But if you see, oh, I'm not doing so well has its highs and lows. As opposed to the conversation that I can have with you is, hello, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing so well. That's very monotonous, right? No, that's not natural. They're looking for the natural um, highs and lows in the conversation. So that's intonation. Then comes the accent. Now, the accent doesn't have to be a UK accent or an English accent or an Australian accent, right? Accent just means that they can understand what you're saying clearly. They don't have to stress too much, right? So you don't have to worry about having a different accent than the native English speakers. You just have to have a very clear accent, right? Um, if there are any questions so far, please do write them down in the chat box. If you think I'm going too fast, let me know. I'll slow down. Right, I believe everything's okay so far. Okay, so the second component of the linguistic criteria is the fluency. What does fluency mean? It encompasses the speed and the smoothness of smoothness on the listener's understanding. Right? So um, are you speaking too fast and they can't get what you're saying? Or are you far too slow and they're bored to death, right? How, how fluent are you? Um, is your conversation, are they able to follow your conversation, right? So that is what fluency means. Now, the, the third linguistic criteria, which is very important, is the appropriateness, the language you're using, how professional you are right? The tone that you're using, are you being very aggressive? Even if the patient is being very jittery, even then you have to make sure that you remain your, maintain your calm, right? You can't get jittery with them or you can't um, tell them off. You need to make sure that you address their concerns and you address them very professionally, very politely, um, making sure that you're very empathetic, right? So all of this comes in appropriateness. Then the language you're using, if the, patient's, if the patient is suddenly, so, uh, suddenly getting very aggressive, how are you dealing with it, right? So that is the appropriateness. Now the resource of expression and grammar, right? How grammatically accurate are you? Are you able to speak sentences? Um, there might be a few errors here and there, but if the grammar at large is okay, they don't um, cut your points at every single slight grammatical error right but they should be able to understand what you're trying to say now the vocabulary um using big words uh, or using very complicated words will not help you uh, take up your um, marks right remember you're talking to a patient so you need to come to their level and make them understand what you're trying to say so using medical jargon medical jargon or uh, using big fat words will not help. You need to make sure that your conversation is as simple as it possibly can, while it also, um, while you also ensure that, the, that you communicate the message clearly, right? So there are four criteria that the examiner will be marking you on. 
Now, these criteria are very, very important to keep in mind and to understand because when the examiner is listening to your recording, they will have these four points in mind and then the next four of the communication, next six of the communication criteria, and they will be marking you on these points, right? So you need to make sure that you know what they are and you're addressing them while you're practicing and you're getting feedback on these points, right? Now, the communication criteria. So communication criteria, again, has further subcomponents. The first one is relationship building. How you open the conversation, right? You need to understand that there is no fixed um, phrase that you can just open up the conversation with. Of course, you can read up and practice, but you need to read the scenario to understand what is going on, right? Um, maybe it is an uh, you are standing in, in, in the emergency department and there's an RTA or a road traffic accident and you're talking to um, a parent whose kid has hurt his head really bad, right? So how do will you decide, how will you open the conversation? What will you say, right? Or if um, somebody's father has passed away and they've come to you to ask what, has, what had happened, how will you initiate the conversation with them? Right. And how will you show your emotions? What will be your tone be like? Are you empathetic? Are you sympathetic? What, you know, is the listener okay with you? Right. So that is called the relationship building. The second subcomponent of the communication criteria is understanding and incorporating the patient's perspective. Right. So even though um, OAT makes it easy. Um, for the test takers that it tells you what are the points that you need to cover, it gives you the task, but you need to ensure that you're not only sticking to the task. If there's anything that the patient is concerned about and they want to know, you're, you're actually ensuring that um, you clarify it for them, right? So that is what, what incorporating the patient means, right? Now, if the patient has, um, if you give a treatment plan and the patient has something else in mind, maybe he's read it on the internet or maybe somebody told him, you know, and even if you think that is not the re correct treatment for them, how are you going to address it? How are you going to tell them tactfully that no, um, this is not the treatment that we're going to go for. This is the treatment that we're going to fo go for without um, negating their emotions up completely, right? So you need to understand that um, where the patient's coming from and then incorporate it together. The third um, sub-criteria is the providing structure. What that means is how you organize the information. Now, um, when you will be practicing with our um, teachers, the speaking um, component, they will tell you that signposting is very, very important. Now, what does signposting mean? Signposting means that once you finish talking about a certain thing and you're going to move on to the next thing, you have to indicate to the um, listener that, okay, we're done talking about the disease. Now we're talking about the treatment, right? So you signpost, you tell them what is next. It is like um, something like a heading, right? So, um, how you introduce the new topic for discussion, how you bring it in. You can't just completely, in a monotonous tone, keep talking and not take the patient's perspective into account, right? Um, so how you organize the information. For example, this patient comes to you, you've diagnosed the disease. Now you ask them, all right, what do you know about your disease? And they will respond. And then you explain it further that, okay, this is what the disease is, and this is how it can cause harm further in your body, right? Then you tell them, I would like to do a few further investigations, right? And after you've told them, okay, I would like to do a few further investigations, you've basically signposted here that now you're going to talk about the investigations. You're, now you're going to talk about the tests, right? And then you can tell them, oh, I would like to do a few blood tests, and these are the blood tests that we would be doing or these are the chest x-rays that I would like you to get done or whatever the investigation is, right? And after you've done that, then you can tell them, now I would like to talk to you about the treatment 
I have a few treatments in mind, but I think this one is the best and go on describing the best treatment for them. But if they want an alternative treatment, you can always tell them the second best option that we can go to is this, this, and this, right? So basically organize your information. Don't tell the treatment first and tell them the disease later. You know, make your thought process very, very clear. So um, the examiner, when he's listening or when she's listening to, the, um, to your recording, they can follow it easily. They don't have to make a lot of effort, you know, and you're not jumping all about. Um, they can just like you watch a movie and you know what's going on. Similarly, they can just hear your conversation and, you know, know what you're talking about and just follow it without much effort, right? Now, the fourth criteria or the fourth subcomponent of the communication criteria is the information gathering. Now, information gathering and the fifth component, information giving, come hand in hand, right? Um, so how do you, what does information gathering actually mean? Um, it basically, uh, for the people who are taking the medicine component or even the nursing component, um, it's how you ask the questions. Are you asking, asking them leading questions or non-leading questions, right? How, uh, how are you approaching them on sensitive um, uh, topics, right? And once they respond, how do you react to it, right? So how are you gathering the information? And then once you've gathered the information, then how, like I explained in providing structure, how are you um, explaining it to them? How are you giving the information? Is it clear enough for them, right? Are they able to follow what you're trying to say? Or are they getting very confused? If they are getting confused, are you able to address their concerns and clarify it for them, right? A lot of times the patient might say, oh, doctor, I don't understand why are you doing this test? You know, even though you've explained it to me, um, I'm unable to follow. So that's completely okay. There's nothing to get, get worried about. That happens in our normal clinical practice as well. So you go back and you ask them, all right, that's completely okay. But um, can you tell me what you're confused about? They will ask you, oh, I don't know why you're getting this blood test done. And you can go on explaining it to them, right? So information gathering and information giving go hand in hand. Um, I'm just going to pause briefly for 10 seconds. If there are any questions, please write them down. If you're following, even then give me a thumbs up so I know you're all there. I want to make this session engaging so I can address all of your concerns. Yes, Maureen, please go ahead, write your question. Right, okay. So let's move on. I hope I am clear up till now. If I'm not, please do stop me. Um, tell me wh what you're confused about so I can address your concerns. So like we discussed initially, um, the scoring criteria is based on two components. It is based on the linguistic criteria and the communication criteria, right? We discussed both of them in detail um, just about now. And linguistic criteria is marked out of six points. So more weightage is given to the linguistic criteria and communication criteria is marked out of three points. Now, just to quickly review, this was the ling linguistic criteria, which is marked out of si six. So these are the components 
that are most important for you to focus on, right? And then the communication criteria, which is marked out of three points, these are the comp uh, components that will automatically come. If this is strong enough, this will automatically come. Since you're already practicing in the medical field, you're already doctors, you know how to talk to a patient, right? You know how to show empathy, you know how to build a relationship, you know how to gather the information. So this usually comes naturally to doctors and nurses, right? This is basically something that um, we struggle with, and this is something that we need to focus on much more. So there are two assessors that will um, grade you. So the interlocutor there does not grade you at all. You only talk to them, right? Um, the conversation gets recorded. And that recorded conversation then goes to two assessors independently who don't know who, what each other is marking, and they grade you against the discussed marking criteria, right? Now, how do you prepare for the test? Okay, we know what the components are, we know what they're marking us um, on, but um, what do I do to improve my preparation? And how do I make sure that I'm preparing in the right direction, right? So um, always, always remember, rote learning will not help you in the speaking criteria. The scenarios can be very, very different and you will only get confused. If you can understand what I'm saying, you already know how to speak English, right? So it is a little bit of tactful teaching that will help you achieve your score. Um, so don't rote learn phases. Of course, while practicing, you will read a lot of um, reviews about people who are telling you, okay, okay, these 30 phrases are the ones that you should learn and learn to incorporate, but I don't think that's the correct way to go about it. You need to know what words to use, yes, but you need to see your scenario. You need to see the patient you're talking to. Is it a child? You know, is it maybe a less than five-year-old child? Is it a teenager? Is it an elderly uh, woman or an elderly man? Who are you talking to? Are you even talking to a patient or are you talking to a relative of a patient, right? Are you talking to a mother of a child? Now that conversation can be difficult to have, or are you talking to a father? Are you, talk, are, are you, are you talking to a man um, whose father passed away recently, right? So who are you talking to? Now, the, what is the healthcare setting? Are you in the emergency department? Are you in the suburban areas? Are you in the um, GP clinic, right? Where are you in the field? Where are you, right? This really matters because this will tell you how to address the conversation. In an emergency environment, um, usually the emotions are running very high, so you need to address them appropriately there. Right in a general in a GP environment, usually it's a follow-up patient, so you talk to them like you know them before. Right, so you need to remember, you, and you need to see who you're talking to and where you are. Personalize your communication. Right, um, just don't talk to everybody in the same tone, in the same manner. If you're talking to a child, um, be a little enthusiastic, be joyful, come to their level, and then make them understand. If you're trying to make a seven-year-old understand um, a heart disease, you can't go into the detail, right? You need to ensure that you are explaining it to them at their level, right? So always personalize your communication. Uh, there is no one script that fits all here. Now, this was a sample. Um, that I just put for you to read. I want you to read this and I want you to um, take a minute and then we'll discuss.
So this is a card for the medicine component, right? But the nursing also is very, very similar. So, so participants here who are giving the nursing criteria don't have to worry too much. Um, it's almost the same, right? Now, this is the card that will be given to you. This is the candidate card, right? It will tell you where you are in a clinic. So let's assume it's in a GP clinic. You're not in the emergency. What is the scenario? What is happening? There's an 88 year old that you're consulting, right? You have given the results from the urine sample. The patient has a UTI and has several proven UTIs. They're concerned about the recurrence and you're discussing the precautions. Their general health is good otherwise. Now, just reading this tells you that this is not a new patient. You've been seeing this patient before and you've advised some tests, right? Why is the patient here? What are his or her concerns? They want to discuss why are they getting recurrent UTIs and the precautions, right? So now your general idea of what the conversation is going to revolve around. What are they expecting you to do? They want you to, they want you to find out about how much fluid the patient is taking, how much exercise um, they generally do, what are they eating, right? They want you to congratulate the patient on their lifestyle. Now you will get a clue here that the diet and the lifestyle is good and that is why they want to congratulate you, right? Congratulate them. They want you to highlight that good hygiene is important and educate the patient on double voiding. Now, see, they've told you here what double voiding means. If you don't know what double voiding means, you will have three minutes um, when you will be preparing this scenario, you can always ask the interlocutor, what does this phrase mean, right? So you don't have to worry about any terms that are there that you don't know. You just have to have a general idea. Remember, it is a test of your English language, not your medical knowledge, right? They want you to suggest a treatment and then they want you to reassure the patient that their UTI will resolve. Now, remember, you have five minutes to complete all of this, to address the patient, to talk to them, to uh, complete all these tasks. Yes, it will be great if you can um, actually complete all of these tasks. But remember, even if you don't complete um, all of them, you complete most of them, your points will not be deducted because they, they are basically testing you on your English fluency and the components that we talked about earlier in the session. But while practicing, ensure that you find out how much time it takes you to actually address each concern, right? Um, here we see that they've, showed, they've shown us significantly that the patient is concerned about the recurrence, right? So you want to uh, focus a little more on reassuring the patient. Also remember that the tasks that it, these are listed they don't have you don't have to actually um, talk to the patient in the same order you can have a very natural conversation and just make sure that you accomplish all of them right so um you don't have to ask about them uh, ask about the lifestyle first but of course when we talked about um uh, organizing our conversation this is the first thing that you should do right um, you will first ask them questions. You will first gather the information. So this comes in first anyway. But if you don't think in another scenario this is relevant and you think other things are more important, you can always address them first. They will not deduct your points. Okay? So this was um, the card, the sample card that you might get and you will have to um, address all of this in five minutes. Now, the card that you will not see, there might be some um, questions that the interlocutor might throw at you or the patient might throw at you that were not visible in this scenario. So be prepared to actually engage in a conversation like you engage in a conversation in your clinic. For example, for the same card, the, can't, the interlocutor might have this card. Now, take a few seconds to read through it.
Now, their task says, explain that you're sick of UTIs and want to take more precautions. So this patient might not actually get reassured very quickly. You know, they will keep on coming back that um, you've already given me treatment, doctor, but I'm still suffering from UTIs. I don't know what is going wrong. Um, they might not be satisfied and you might have to engage in a conversation. Always remember not to get aggressive, not to dismiss their concern and keep addressing their concern as many times as you have to till they are satisfied. That is most important, right? Again, at the end, the interlocutor might come at the same um, thing I, that they're not satisfied, right? They want you to keep reassuring them that the treatment will stop the infections. Now, it will depend on you on how you will tactfully engage in a conversation and convince them that even though you cannot tell them for sure that this will, but your hope that this will elevate their symptoms. Now, tactfully conversing only comes from practice and the right feedback. Um, if you're only starting to prepare for OET speaking, I would recommend record yourself a few times so you know where you're lacking, right? And after that, start con conversing in English with your family and friends. And then once you're confident in, uh, enough, you can always you should actually always um, gain feedback from uh, a teacher who knows this, uh, the OET medicine subject or the OET nursing subject well. So they can tell you uh, where you're lacking and what you need to polish, right? What are the main pointers that you need to keep in mind while you're in a conversation? We've addressed this um, initially as well. Please remember who you're talking to. Is this the patient? Is this a relative? Is this a child? Is it an elderly patient, right? One size does not fit all. You have to have an individual conversation, a tailor-made conversation with everyone. The age of the patient, like we discussed. The situation, where are you placed, right? Knowledge, how much does the patient know? This is very, very important. Um, maybe there comes a patient who you've just seen in, in the emergency department who you think has had a heart attack or is having a heart attack, right? Before actually disclosing the information, you need to ask them, what do you know, right? And then pick up from there. This will also make it easier for you to converse and how to, uh, and to initiate the conversation. If there's a patient who comes to you in the GP clinic, and maybe you see in the reports that they have cancer, again, you ask them how much do they know and how much do they want to know? Some people do not want to know their prognosis. So you ask them first. You do not just assume, right? Always address the emotions of the patient. If the patient is not talking to you, if the patient's very quiet, you're trying to converse with them and they're not responding, they're giving you one-worded answers, you ask them. You, maybe you can phrase it like, uh, I, I see that you're very disturbed. Is there, in, is there any way that I can help you? Or uh, you look very sad today. What is that that is disturbing you? You know, something on those lines. Ask them about their emotions if they're not talking to you. This is a way to make them talk and to have a conversation with them. Again, the points that we discussed earlier. The communication. When you're conversing with the patient, when you're talking to the patient, understand the patient's perspective. Do not go on lecturing them, right? Do not tell them, Oh, um, these are the list of investigations that you need to be, uh, need to get done. Or you have this disease, and you will get this treatment. Bye. This is not how you how you converse with the patient. You greet the patient. You build a relationship. You, depending on the scenario, you ask them about their disease. You 
tell them that you would like to get a few investigations done and if they are okay with it. If they are, then you tell them what are the treatment plans that you have in mind. You know, uh, if the patient has any concerns about the investigation, about the treatment, about the disease, you make sure that you respond to their queries, you clarify it for them, right? You engage the patient. Talking um, will not score you higher points, right? You need to make sure that you're having a conversation. That will lead to more points. Y using empathy. Empathy, again, um, if the patient is getting aggressive, you do not get aggressive with them. If the patient's getting jittery, it does not mean let you lose your temper. You need to maintain your calm. You are a doctor or a nurse, and the patient might be experiencing um, emotions because of the certain setting. Right? So you need to keep the, that in mind and you need to empathize with them. The explanation you're giving shouldn't be full of medical jargon. You shouldn't tell them, oh, you have um, uh, IHD or ischemic heart disease. Tell them what IHD is. Tell them what it means, right? So explain it to them. Or even if you're passing maybe a cannula, a simple um, explanation of or how I will cl clean this area and I will pass the needle under your skin into your vein and how, for how long it will it hurt or it will not hurt and what will you do after that? Will you take out the cannula? Explain it to them. Be it a procedure, be it a disease, be it anything. Simple and clear explanation with no big fancy words, with no medical jargon, right? Um, sometimes um, students come to me and tell me, that uh, Dr. Maruch, I, I had my test yesterday and um, I used a lot of medical jargon, but then I explained. That is completely okay as well, because as doctors in clinical setting or as nurses in clinical setting, you're used to using medical jargon, right? So sometimes you, uh, you tend on saying um, heart attack and then actually realize that you're supposed to explain it, right? And then you say, do you know what that means? And the patient might say, oh, I don't, or I do know what it, what it means. And you ask them, what do you know about it? And they will give you an explanation and then you further clarify it for them. So even if there's a slip of tongue, don't worry about it, don't panic, explain it to them, right? The fourth very, very important thing, check for understanding. Whatever you're telling them, do they understand? Are they following? Are they zoned out? Or do they not, are they not following your accent? Um, are they not able to understand what you're trying to say? So after every um, topic that you discuss, be it disease, be it treatment, or be it any other thing, stop and ask them if they're following you, if they understand, if they have any questions for you so far. So check for understanding, right? And this will also help you ensure that the conversation um, that, that that it remains a conversation and not a lecture. So with that, um, I'm just going to stop here and ask you if you have any questions. Are you able to understand what I'm trying to communicate? Please leave a message in the chat box so I know. Good, okay. So moving forward. The, the listening stage. When you're talking to the patient, when you're gathering information, encourage them to continue. How can you encourage them to continue? You know, while you're talking, while they're talking, you can say, oh, okay, I see. Hmm. Please go on. Thank you for that. Thank you for telling me. You know, don't stop their conversation. Whatever they're trying to tell you, let them talk. Don't interrupt. Right? Don't say, oh, um, you've gone into a detailed history. I don't need this information. You don't do that. Right? Let them complete their sentence and then signpost. If you want, maybe the uh, conversation is not going where you want it to go. That's okay. Let them complete their sentence. And once, once they pause, you can signpost. I see, for example, you can say, 
I see that this is bothering you and I will address this. But before that, I need to address this and this, you know, you can signpost that, okay, maybe I need to, um, I know that you're very afraid of getting an angiography done, but before that, I need to know um, about your disease. Have you had any prior um, investigations? You know, you can inter uh, you can signpost, but don't interrupt them all together. Like, don't break off their sentences. Provide an appropriate response. What does that mean? That means if they're asking you a question, you don't give them a scripted answer. You give them uh, a tailor-made answer. You give them an answer that actually addresses their concern, and you know you actually address what they're trying to say. So even if it's not included in the task, but the patient is asking you something, you address that. Don't get nervous that, oh, this wasn't in the task. How am I supposed to talk about this information, right? We've discussed this already. Um, there will be a variety of scenarios. So you need to ensure during your practice that you are not only practicing a certain type of scenarios, one or two. Um, don't keep repeating the same scenarios practice as many scenarios as you possibly can. Record yourself. Record, recording yourself will give you confidence and will tell you where you're lacking. Is it the fluency, is it the pronunciation, is it the tone? What is it that you need to improve on, right? So record yourself. Then get feedback. You can get feedback from your peers, from people who are preparing for OET, you can get feedback from, you can generally start talking in English and people who are good in English can tell you how grammatically accurate you are, how fluent you are, and what are the things that you need to focus on, right? And then of course, the OET tutors. Um, you can always get individual feedback from them and they will be able to help you the most. There are a, a certain list of useful phrases that you can actually, um, you know, go, through them but i would recommend just going over them um while you're practicing different scenarios but not actually rote learning them because if you rote learn uh, you will get very confused if a different scenario comes so don't do that uh, don't learn scripted uh, answers ha just have generalized conversation right So that was um, what we've discussed so far was how you will prepare before the test. What are the things that you should keep in mind before the test, right? What about on the day of test? What happens? Um, I touched upon this in the beginning as well. When you enter, you will have about two minutes to warm up, to get used to, their, to, get used to your surroundings, to talk to the interlocutor, to confirm your name and ID. Um, ask them any questions, right? So if you have anything that's bothering you, take this time to actually communicate with, the, with your interlocutor, right? When you're given your card and your time starts to prepare, when you're given your candidate card, uh, you're, you will be given three minutes to prepare, right? I'm sure that by that, you, by that time, you, you will be very, very confident um, just see what your tasks are and maybe with a pencil right in the bracket, how, how much time do you plan on giving on each task, right? 30 seconds, 40 seconds to maybe understanding the disease or understanding the history and maybe focus more on the reassuring part. That will really depend on the scenario, but plan your time according to the task, right? The scenario will tell you uh, how, what are the patient's emotions, right? The general it will give you a general feel. So and just think about it. If the patient is very aggressive or the patient is very sad or the patient is very happy, how are you going to address the emotions? Also remember who you're talking to. Is it the patient themselves or is it a relative of a patient, right? You need to uh, address the conversation the same way. Adapt your language according to the scenario and think about how you're going to start your role play. Um, is this a follow-up patient? Are you seeing this patient in a GP clinic? Or is this an emergency patient, right? So are you talking to the patient in the emergency who is on a stretcher or are you talking to a mother 
who is ba and you're telling them um, how their baby is doing inside, right? So it, it really depends uh, what the scenario is. So think about how you're going to start the role play. When your five minutes uh, for speaking start, keep talking. Like I discussed, don't stop. Um, even if you've accomplished all your tasks, you can maybe um, go over them again or to ask them if they have any questions that they would like to address you or see if they understand what you've said, ask them to repeat it for you, engage them in a conversation, right? So keep talking for five minutes. Five minutes is a not, not a lot of time. I'm, I've been talking for 53 minutes now. So um, when you start practicing, you will realize five minutes go by very, very quickly. Balance the talking and the listening part. Don't just keep talking. Remember, it is a conversation. It is not a lecture. So listen to the patient and respond accordingly. Address the patient's concerns, even if they're not included in the task. Remember, it is an English test, not a medical test. So even if there is a disease or if there is a drug or if there is an investigation that you don't know about, you can give them a vague answer, but an answer on the same lines, right? So um, don't worry if it is medically incorrect, just focus on the English language. I'm open for questions now.